לעילוי נשמת, this year will be לעילוי נשמת נתנאל בן יעל טוב. few days before שבועות we are, few days before accepting the Torah, I hope everybody here prepared enough. Some will get the Torah in one level, some will get the Torah in a different level. Depend what you did in the entire year. How much you care for the Torah? Is the Torah for you? It's another history book? Is it maybe nice stories to hear when you're bored? Or it's a way of life? If it's a way of life, very good. If not a way of life, you have a problem. One of the, of the Shivot invited an American uh, congresswoman to a party of Simchat Torah. And she saw all the religious boys da- dancing with the Torah. She never saw in her life a Torah scroll. So she asked the rabbi, what are they dancing with? So the rabbi told her with the book of the Torah, the book, our book of laws. She couldn't believe this. She said, what? They dancing with the book of laws? She said, I'm in this country in politics for so many years. I never saw in my life one American holding the book of law, the Constitution of the United States in 4th and July and dance. If any, people step on it. <laughs> you understand the difference? When people wrote the law, there's no reason to dance with that. When the creator of the world wrote the law, of course there's a more, than, more than plenty of reasons to dance with that. When Hafez Chaim was young, he said, when I was young, I had a dream. I wanted to save the entire world, to go to all the people in the world, the Jews, and teach them about Hashem, about the Torah, teach them the purpose of life, teach them what needs to be done better. Then I realized it's not realistic. And I decided maybe I'm going to stay focused on only the people of my country. Then I saw it's really not realistic, so I decided maybe I'm going to stay in my city, Radin, maybe the people of Radin. Then I saw it's too hard of a mission. I decided maybe I'm just going to focus on my own family. I saw even that it's not so simple, and I decided, you know what, I might as well focus on myself. Let me first correct myself. After I'll correct myself, we'll see. So after he corrected himself, he started to dream big again. He said, okay, now it's time to take care of my family, and then the city of Radin, and then the rest of the country, and then the world. Uh, today, it's needless to say that every religious Jew in the world has a, a book of the Hafez Chaim. It's about Lashon Hara. It's one of the important mitzvot of the Torah, one of the restrictions. It's not one scene from the Torah, it's a combination. Gossip, uh, ruining someone's reputation, speaking bad about people, even if it's the truth about him. He taught us a lot in this book. It was hard a little bit to know the rules before he came up with this book. But we learn many fantastic books, many fantastic laws about it. The truth is that if the Jews will get to a level of unity, even in one synagogue, there's plenty of synagogues here in Queens, in Great Neck, in Manhattan, in Muncie, in Lakewood, in Baltimore, in LA, many other places, in, even in Miami now, plenty of synagogues. But according to the Zohar, all you need is one synagogue that everybody is there loving each other and they're united. Unity and one synagogue in the world was able to bring Mashiach already. That's the words of the Zohar. If it didn't happen in 2,000 years, that means something went wrong. I guess there was no unity. Jealousy, gossip, arguments, problems, fighting who's going to pray. I have a your side, why you gave it to him, the Gabbai. Actually in Shul, 
sometimes in shul you want to really, you see really who is really religious and who is a fake religious guy. In shul, you, you, if you follow the way the people behave in shul, you know really how much irat shamayim they have. How much they talk in the middle of the davening, it shows that they irat shamayim, that they don't have it. How much they care for the actual prayers. How much they're listening to the reading of the Torah. When the rabbi gives the drasha as shiur, you see how the people take the Torah. If they're serious about the Torah, or when the rabbi is speaking, they're always outside talking. Hashem said to the Jews, A mesir ozno mishmo Torah, gam tfilato to'eva. If I see that you, my son, getting out or are not interested to listen to the words of my Torah, even your prayer is filthy, despicable in my eyes. Did you hear that? How many people in the world know that they just came Shabbat morning to the synagogue and sat there, some places it's three, four hours. It shouldn't be that way. It should be two hours and 20 minutes and that's it. Because the righteous people in some places I went to see, they don't dive in more than two hours and 20 minutes on Shabbat. And they do it very well, with kavana, with wonderful laning. Everything is perfect. The rabbi even speaks 10 minutes, and it's two hours and 20 minutes. The longer they make it, the more the people suffer. It's called Torah Tzibur. The more you make the people suffer, the people are not anxious to come to synagogue. And sometimes it's someone's decision in a shul that makes a lot of people not liking the davening. Not that they don't really like the davening, they just don't like how long does it take. And it's a problem. So sometimes when you try to be too much righteous, more than what Hashem told you, you make a lot of other people suffer, what's happened in the end? You do one little mitzvah and hundreds of people are frustrated, it's called Torah Tzibur. Torah Tzibur. Making, bothering the public. I'm not saying to make it fast, fast, fast to get rid of it. Don't get me wrong. That's also very bad. Much worse. I'm saying to read every word carefully, to pay attention to the words from A to Z. How many people know that they sit in Shabbat three or four hours, they're praying, they, and then when the Rav speak five, ten minutes and they get out or they fall asleep, that they just ruin their entire three hours of prayer. It's like filling up a big barrel full of water or, or oil, whatever you fill it up with. And just when it's about to be full completely and be sealed and shipped to the customer, you're knocking it down and it's all spilled. Why? Because that five minutes that the rabbi spoke in the end, you fell asleep, Hashem said, ah, that's, the, that's what my Torah is for you. I'm not interested in your prayer. Thank you very much. Goodbye. If it wouldn't be written, I wouldn't have the guts to say it. It's a big thing, you know. It's a, uh, what, uh, <laughs> who has the guts to make up such a thing? It's, it says, it says, a Messir Ozno, someone who remove his ear from listening to the Torah, Gam Tfilato Toeva. His prayer is despicable. Death? You ask a very problematic question. Why? Because in the entire books, all the books of Judaism, everywhere, the Gemara, the books that came after, the halacha is that a deaf person is dismissed, is not obligated to keep any mitzvah. A, dead person is almost, a deaf person is almost like a dead person. Why? Because it's not communicated with Hashem. However, today with the advanced technology, Baruch Hashem, one of the greatest uh, achievements that people uh, achieve is making all kinds of hearing aid for deaf people that born deaf uh, or developing a, a, a sign uh, language that able to educate the deaf people almost 100% like regular people. Some of them even became lawyers, I heard. Some of them are accountants. So obviously they have almost no limitation when it comes to success. Is it possible to say that a deaf person is dismissed from keeping mitzvot today, in today's generation? The answer, of course not. Once the world is changed, and now they are, the reality is changed, all the laws that apply to this specific reality does not apply anymore. When the time of the Gemara, someone was born deaf, his parents had nothing to do with him. 
He was walking in a field alone with his life, with the sheep or the animals that he had. And there was nothing to do with him. He couldn't send him to yeshiva. They didn't know how to communicate with him. So this person never heard a sound, never heard a voice. He didn't have any earpiece. He didn't have sign language. He did not really have any anything. There was no way to no way to do anything with him. Obviously, a person like this cannot pray, cannot learn Torah, and he doesn't know how to do the mitzvot. So somebody like this, the Torah says, dismissed. Not only that, even if he made a damage to someone, he doesn't have to pay. But if somebody hurt him, he has to pay him. So if somebody hit a deaf person and caused him a damage, he has to pay him for the damage. But if a deaf person hurt somebody else, he was not guilty. That's what the Gemara says. A little boy, younger than Bar Mitzvah, a deaf person and a fool. Uh, a fool is really not the right word. Someone that is mentally ill or is, is uh, like maybe autistic. There's many different kinds of shoteh, shoteh means someone who, who cannot function, his brain doesn't work. Somebody like this, if he make a damage to someone, you cannot convict him in a court. Today, is it possible to think that a deaf person that is a wonderful accountant and he's doing all the IRS bills for his company, companies and, and, and he's able to communicate with the sign language and, and uh, all these things, he's going to hit somebody with a car or if he punched a person and, and, and took his eye out, so he's going to come to court and say, I'm deaf? What is this? So the answer is, it's a problem though. Don't think that all the rabbis agree with what I said. It's an argument among the rabbis of this generation, because the problem only arises in this generation. Until 20, 30, 40 years ago, deaf person was still in a serious problem. Today they advanced... Also, you should know that from the Torah, if he married a woman, she's not really married. He has no skills to make a woman his wife. But today, we have a big problem today. The rabbis made his kiddushin kiddushin. But today, we have a big problem today. Today, if a deaf person wants to get married, he's getting married. What's the kiddushin? Is from the rabbanan or from the oraita? Today. In the past, it was from the rabbanan. Rabbanan made a rule that is going to count like a married person. Today... Like I said, you ask a, a problematic question. The Torah, you should know, is different than any other science, any other knowledge. Anything you're going to learn, if you learn one hour, you'll, you'll just gain X amount of knowledge. If you're going to learn two hours, you're going to double your knowledge. If you're going to learn four hours, you're going to double your knowledge again. So every hour, if you learn one page in an hour, in an average, that means every hour it's a page. So if you learn a thousand hours, it's a thousand pages in a Gemara. That's in, a, or in every book you're going to learn, it goes by how many hours you learn. But by the Torah, it's like a snowball. The longer you learn... The longer you learn, it's you doubling and tripling the amount of knowledge that you're gaining. I'll give you an example. Rabbi Akiva went to learn 12 years in yeshiva. When he came, he heard his wife speaking to the neighbor. The neighbor told her, look at your husband. He married you, left you here alone, and left you for 12 years. You think he remembers you after 12 years? Just when Rabbi Akiva showed up, he hears his wife speaking to the neighbor. So he, he was about to walk in and surprise his wife after 12 years. Think about the scenario here. And then he hears that his wife tell the neighbor, believe me, if I could, if I had a way to communicate with him. Remember, there was no SMS yet. So if I had a way to communicate with him, I would tell him to stay for 12 more years. So Rabbi Akiva turned around and he left. And he really came back after 12 years. So that means altogether 24 hours. Everybody asked this famous question, why Rabbi Akiva didn't walk in for one day to hug his wife after 12 years, to be with her, to eat dinner with her, to take her for a walk, maybe an hour. 
to see his wife after 12 years. You know, he came from far away. You already, it's one step from your home. The answer is 12 years with a time out. And another 12 years will never be like 24 years in a row. What is it like? If you put a pot on the fire, you want to boil in the water, and it needs 10 minutes. If you put it 5 minutes, take it out for a minute. If you put it 5 more minutes, it's also 10 minutes. The water did not boil. Torah, Torah, the secret of learning Torah is the longer you stretch the learning, then every minute it's better than the previous one. The Vilna Gaon said to his students, if a person will learn 3 hours and 15 minutes, I don't know where he came up with his number from, I'm not reading the mind of the Vilna Gaon, but that's what he said. If you learn 3 hours and 15 minutes in a row without any break, no telephone, no getting up for tea, coffee, nothing, no bathroom, no nothing, a person goes to the bathroom before he sits to learn, he sits for 3 hours and 15 minutes without interference, then it's guaranteed for him to be a Talmid Chachaim in his lifetime. Only 3 hours and 15 minutes. But if he's going to learn 10 hours a day, but 2 hours, half an hour break. 2 hours, half an hour break. 2 hours, half an hour break. 10 hours, he won't reach what the guy learned 3 hours and 15 minutes in a row without stopping. In history, it's not like this. It, in math, it's not like this. What do you see here? I once asked my cousin, I don't know if you remember, I told you I have a cousin. I still look for one person in his world that will be similar to him. I didn't find. It's one of a kind, this person. Such a power of will. Everything he wants to do, he gets there. Yetzer hara, no yetzer hara. Nothing will stand in his way. Amazing, amazing. A very hard-working person when it comes to the truth. I'm not talking about his brilliance, how genius he is, that's besides the point. So, I once asked him, after 10 years only was learning, 10 years, it's not that much in yeshiva, 10 years. I told him, how, how every question I ask you, you know the answer immediately. You never need to go, tell me, give me five minutes, I get back to you to check in a book. You always know the answer right away. Not only that, you know the answer according to all the opinions. How is it possible? So he told me, what do you think? The Torah, it's how many years you learn? It doesn't work that way. The Torah is, now you are entering the yeshiva in level A. The more you show Hashem that you're anxious to get to level B, I'm dying together already. I have to make it. You're going to have shortcuts. Hashem elevates you faster than what you can do it on your own. It's all a gift. You see, understanding the Torah, understanding the wisdom of the Creator of the world, it's not history lesson or math. That's nature. Torah, it's above nature. The Jews is a special nature. They're above nature. Na nature. All the, the nations depend on nature. There's only one nation that they are also in, na in the nature. They also behave like we behave according to the rules of nature. But we have a bonus. We can press a button and the rules of this creation, the rules of nature, does not apply to us anymore. The Gemara brings the story, Rabbi Uda Nasi, his daughter, actually it was Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, his daughter, one of them, I'm not sure, one of them, his daughter, was getting married that day. So the house was full, I think it's Rebbe. The house was full of guests. Hundreds, maybe thousands of guests, they serving food to everyone. So in the morning, he saw that just where his daughter is, there was a snake, and there's like a needle that she used to put a clip in, the, in her hair. So she, when she was taking it off, it was very dark, you know, it's not like today you have electric, she was sticking it to the wall. So she, he saw in the morning that she stuck it into the head of a snake or something. That was right there on by the wall, coming out from the wall. So he asked her, what mitzvah you did last night? So she told him everybody was busy with the wedding and the meal, and a poor person was standing in the door dying to get a meal. Nobody was paying attention to him. So I gave him my plate. 
I had my plate that they served me. I gave him my plate. So he told her, this mitzvah last night saved your life. The Gemara said one of the, star, one of the goyim was watching in the stars all the people who go to work in the field that day. His name was Avlet, a goy. And he was able to read, you know, like in the time of Egypt, the Egyptians were experts in reading in the stars. So that guy was, was able to look at the stars and tell you what's going to happen. It's amazing what knowledge they had at the, in the old generations. So he told the, the Rav, he told him, you see that Jew over there? He's going today to the, to the field and he's not coming back. He's dying. That's his last day of his life. So the rabbi told him, he is going to come whether you like it or not. He's coming back tonight. So the Gemara says when the Jew came back, the rabbi was right. The guy couldn't believe it. He said, what is going on? I never made mistakes. I know I read in the stars. So the, I told him, no, you really didn't make mistakes, the rabbi told him. You were right. But we, the Jews, have a way like to circumvent nature, go around it. So he called the Jew and said, tell me, please. Let me see. He had a bag hanging on his back. And over there is a dead snake inside. So he took it off. He showed the Jew, look what you just got saved from, from a poison snake. So he asked the Jew, what mitzvah you made today? So he told him, we're eating lunch together, all the workers, and everybody brings something to the lunch. Everybody contributes something. So I, today, was the one that going around with a basket. Not the Torah anytime basket. They had a different basket. So I walk with a basket from every one of the people. One, one person put cheese, the other one puts bread, the next person put tomatoes. Everybody put something, and then they serve it, and they do the meal. When I got to one of the workers, he looked at me like this. He said, I don't have anything. He didn't have so I pretended that he put something in, and I walked around, and I did not tell anyone that this person didn't have. I didn't want to embarrass him. So he told him, the Rav, this has just saved your life. That's what we mean, the Jew is above, above nature. The Gemara says that when a person is born, everything is decided for him. If it's going to be rich or poor, it's decided. Healthy or sick, decided. Male, female, smart, not so smart, everything is predecided. Except righteous or wicked. That's the only thing it's in our hand a hundred percent. But the Gemara says one of the rabbis was very, very poor. Very, very poor. So poor he didn't have even a piece of bread to eat. One day he was starving. And what, what happened? He saw that the only thing he has in his house is a clove of garlic. <laughs> imagine when he didn't eat for a few days. Try to imagine yourself, Yom Kippur is over, you're eating raw garlic. What's going to happen to you? But God forbid if a person feels he's about to die from starvation, he might as well try the garlic, no? <laughs> Maybe it's going to give him some energy, something, I don't know. So he was eating the garlic. Of course, the girl didn't make him, made him fainted, and he fell on the floor, and he fainted. Then he saw a vision. When he woke up, he was telling what happened. He saw that God came to him, and he said to Hashem, how long am I going to suffer like this? How long? All my life is going to be like this? Never going to be an improvement? So Hashem told him, do you want me to reverse the entire world to the beginning point, maybe you will reborn in a better luck, in a better time, because remember, there's 12 months, each man has his sign. Each man has different fortune. Do you want me to reverse everything? Maybe, maybe not even guarantee, maybe you will reborn in the right time for wealth. So he told him, depend. Did I live already most of my life, or most of my life are ahead of me? So Hashem told him, most of your life is behind you. You passed it already. So he said, you know, it doesn't pay to take a risk, to go to the beginning. Maybe it could be worse. <laughs> what could be worse? So he said to Hashem, no, no. So Hashem told him, but don't worry. In the world to come, I have 13 rivers of Farsimon oils ready for you. It's all analogies, you know, it's all like Mishalim. We don't really know the secrets of the story, but I'm just telling you the story as it is. 
There's a lot of secrets hidden here. So I told him I have rivers of a special oil, like perfume. They used to have perfume. Like it's called Shemen Afarsemon. That's what the oil of Afarsemon. I don't know in today's world if we have that special precious oil. So he told him, that's all? He tells Hashem, that's all what you got for me? So Hashem said, what? You don't want to leave anything for your friends? So he told Hashem, why am I talking to a human being that have limited amount of reward to give? I'm talking to Hashem, you have as much as you want, so give me and give them. So Hashem told him, if you're not going to be quiet, I'm going to shoot an arrow right in between your eyes to your forehead. So he was, he, the people, the students that were looking at him saw that sparks of fire coming out of his nose. And they woke him up, he said what he saw. What are we learning from this story? That when the day you are born, your fortune, uh, when it comes to money, the entire wealth is decided already. You can see it right there, depend who your parents are. If you're born to very wealthy parents, you don't have to worry about money all your life. Some kids who are born to parents, they know that they have to do it on their own. Their parents won't be able to help them. And some people, they have ups and downs, you know. They can born and be poor, and then one day they become rich, or the other way around. Yes, we know that. But you have to know, in that case, if that's the case, why are we praying for Parnassah all the time? If you connect two electrodes to the brain of a person, if you can read his mind, this is how the davening is. Parnassah, 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 everything Parnassah. It's like a broken record. You know how the CD sometimes scratch? Hashem is tired listening to it. 6.4 billion in all religions and cults praying to one thing, money. Money, money, money. money. Some Jews praying for righteous kids, that they'll be Talmidei Chachamim, maybe for wife, to find a wife. Yes, I'm not saying no. But the main thing in the davening, what is it? But people are praying all the time. Why did I lose? Why the deal doesn't go through? Help me buying the building. Don't do it to me, Hashem. I worked six months for the deal. Why? Why? It's not fair. <coughs> One woman asked me a few days on the phone, very good questions. She was asking very good questions. Very smart woman. So then in the end, when I saw that if she's so bright, this woman... Then I'm sure she has thousands of questions like this, because the smarter you are, the more questions you have about life. It's true that the Torah gives you the answer to these questions, but every answer brings you to another question, because it's all connected, you know, it's like a chain. Okay, I got that part, now I have another question. Okay, you answer me this, now I have five more questions. It's never going to end. Don't ever think that a person will reach perfect knowledge in this life. So then I told her, you know what? One question she asked, I told her, you know the truth? You want me to tell you the truth or you want me to give you a beautiful answer? So she said, no, no, only the truth. So you, you, you don't want to hear a beautiful answer, it will convince you. She said, no, what good is a beautiful answer if it's not the truth? One rabbi gave us a lecture on Shabbat in front of more than a thousand people in his shul. And one of the people asked him a very good question. And he was standing there for five minutes, thinking, everybody was whispering, wow, look what happened to the Rav. He doesn't give him an answer, we can answer it. Nobody's speaking. One of the laws of manners is that when your rabbi is there, you don't open your mouth. Somebody asks him even a simple question, you let him answer. You don't say, oh, I'll answer you. So... Nobody is saying anything. And then the Rav say, okay, you're right. Thank you very much. Shabbat Shalom. He closed this book and he went and he sat down. Now the people went crazy. What? Right when the davening finished, he came to the Rav. What's going on, Rabbi? What are you doing? Rabbi. <laughs> what? You, don't you know the answer? What? You don't know this Tosfot? You don't know that Rashi? The Rambam spoke about it. I'm sure you know all this. So he told them, I had five great answers to tell him. 
five great answers, and I promise you, each one of them would convince him 100%. But I was wondering to myself, is it 100% truth, the answer, or it's only 90%, or maybe 50%? I was thinking, each question, each answer that I was about to tell him, I wasn't convinced myself that I'm telling him the truth 100%. So it's better to say I don't know the answer than to give him something that it's like half and half just to close his mouth. You understand? He went and sat down. Today, everybody pulls an answer. Oh, very good. He ate it. He's convinced. <laughs> so she asked a question. So I told her, you want to really know the answer? The answer is nobody will ever know the answer. That's the answer. She said, what do you mean? I said, only Hashem knows. He never told us that secret. What was the question? question that you all ask. Why, after all the explanations, we still don't really know why Hashem made the world the way He made it, why He made us here, why we have to go through this entire tiring process of tests and achieving and earning and suffering and so many miserable people out here and so much suffering involved and wars and this and animals and so many things are not clear yeah we have a lot of beautiful answers but the bottom line we will never we cannot understand the final and the most important question that Hashem could create it in a, create us in a place that he will give us the greatness and we would sit for billions of years and enjoy it, and we will never feel bad about getting it for free. We we'll just say, give us more, give us more, and give us the more he gives us, the more we want to take advantage more. And we wouldn't feel bad about it. Why? Why should we feel bad about it? Shem made us in a way that if we get too much when we don't deserve it, we feel bad about it. But he could have made us different. He could have just put us in a place and give us his greatness, and the soul will enjoy so much. This is, what, this is the ultimate success, to get to that point, that you're going to receive this great reward. Just put us there. What do we need this whole process? That was her question. So I told her, nobody will ever know. Only Hashem knows. But then I told her something else. I told her, but between me and you, what's the difference? Well, we don't know. But that's what we have to do. That's the, that's the recommendation. we got to stick to the rules. What is it like? You have a king. The king say, if you're going to climb to that mountain over there, I'm going to give you a blue diamond. So you tell the king, I can't, be, I can't get convinced. Why is it blue and not yellow diamond? Until I'm going to know why you chose the color blue, I cannot go through this entire path now. That's us. Why Hashem made me a hill like this, a mountain like this, ups and down, thorns, hot weather, rain, it's so hard to climb. And in the end, he decided that he wants to give me this and this and this. Why? Why? I don't understand. What do you care, you fool? Just go get the diamond. You don't have to know everything. If you look today, most of the arguments between the non-religious people to the religious people are irrelevant questions. None of these questions almost, it's important for the life. How old is the world? How old is the world? Well, what do you care how old is the world? What do you care? Billion, five billion, five thousand, six thousand, who cares? Right now you are in the present. You have a job to do. If you're going to do it, you'll earn. If you're not going to do it, you lose. Focus on what you have to do. That's what's important right now. Uh, I want to know if there are really dinosaurs here. Wow, how can we live without knowing it? I want to know if there are other people living in different stars. There are life in Mars, or in Neptune, or in that star. We must know it. The problem is that it, this stupidity of those people cost us a lot of money. <laughs> we have to pay for their nonsense. Who pays, you think, for these billions of dollars that they spend on all these trips that they go and check and take pictures? What for? Yeah, somebody from Neptune is calling. <laughs> <laughs> he got angry. Maybe he got upset, yeah.
Is it based on scientific evidence or it's another one of their theories? It's a theory. Who's to say that if we're going to find out if there are other creatures in different stars, it's going to benefit us in any way. Maybe they, maybe they don't know about us, and when they find out that we are here, they're going to come over and make us a million times more miserable than we are already. Just think about it. How do you know? We have enough enemies. Imagine now we're going to have out-of-space enemies. <laughs> maybe they have better machines than what the Palestinian, Palestinians use. One thing for sure. If there are other creatures in different worlds, when they come and land here, they'll be anti-Semites. That's for sure. <laughs> like everybody else was always. <laughs> That's the reality, right? It's always going to be like this. Let's move on. The last parasha that we read we saw something very interesting. The Pasuk says, Israel, and the nation of Israel did, Kechol asher tziva Hashem et Moshe. Everything that Hashem ordered Moshe can asu. But the truth is, if you really pay attention, the order was not for the entire nation of Israel. It was only for the Levites, the Leviim. Only the Leviim had to do what Hashem told them. But the Torah says the entire nation of Israel did it. Who could answer me what's the secret in this verse inside the Torah? I repeat, God comes and gives an order only to one family, the family of Moshe, the Levim. This is what you have to do. A, B, C, this is what you do. Then the Torah wants to say, that they really listened to Hashem and they did everything He told them. So instead of writing, and the Levihim did everything God told them, the Torah say, and the nation of Israel listened to God and did everything He told them. He didn't speak to the nation of Israel, He told the Levihim. What's the secret here? Can you, can you think after reading Chinese or it's hard? You know, one guy, one guy say, why do I have to wait for the time of Mashiach to believe in the resurrection of the dead? I see it every week. So they told him, you see the resurrection of the dead every week? He said, sure. Every Shabbos, 2 o'clock, I see a person that ate chulent, he falls on a bed, and he's able to get up. That's the resurrection of the dead. So I ask you the same question. After Chinese, your mind can still work? All right, so what do you think? What's the secret here? Every word in the Torah is planned. Everybody did according to what they were commanded. In, in the future, the Levine, the, the priests come from, uh, go back to the firstborn of every family, or I'm guessing. You're not in the right direction. The question is, the question is very simple. Hashem came to a group of Jews, the Levim, told them this is what you have to do. It doesn't even matter what he told them to do. Just to understand the concept here. You have to do something, and right after that, Hashem confirmed that they did what they did. But when he confirmed it, instead of writing, they, the Levim, do everything Hashem told them, he changed it. And he said, and the nation of Israel did what Hashem told them. Nation of Israel, it's not the Levim. The laws of the Levim and the laws of an average Jew sometimes is completely different. For sure, we didn't, he didn't talk to the entire nation of Israel. We are going to learn now a proof to what I've been telling you for many years. You heard it from me hundreds of times. What's the proof? Everything that every time you support somebody financially, you give him money, every mitzvah he does count like you did it. It goes into your account. Who sponsored the Levim? Who give them the parnasa, their salary? They get the 10% from every Jew goes to the Levim. Since the Levim don't have to worry about parnasa, they sit and learn Torah, even in Egypt it was like this. Needless to say, when they were in the desert or entered Israel, 
since they are eating from the donations of the entire nation of Israel, everything they do, the Torah say, and the nation of Israel did. Why? You paid for him, he learns Torah, it counts you learn Torah. You come to Shamaim, you come to your trial, all of a sudden you may hear, this Jew, this wonderful Jew, wonderful Jew, I think they made a mistake, I'm lucky. Thanks to him, 300 Jews are keeping fully the Torah and the mitzvot. So thanks to me? I never spoke to any Jew about keeping mitzvot. What is it? They show you. You remember you gave money to this, you bought discs, you bought this, you pay for that, you pay for that. This organization, you arrange a seminar, you call some friends to come to the lectures. Thanks to the fact that these people are keeping the mitzvot, it counts like you did it yourself. It's a proof. It's a strong proof. David Amelech wrote, You know when I'm happy? That's what he says. When I'm close to Hashem. What am I really want, David Amelech? He has, he's a king, he has a palace, he has soldiers, wives, servants, money, Fame, beauty, what else a person can ask for? And he's not happy. What's his dream? I want to be close to Hashem. If we will be close to Hashem, 1% of David Amelech and the day that we died, it's going to be such an achievement for us. If we be 1% of David Amelech, go read the Tehillim. If you read Tehillim, you understand what I'm talking about, for those who read. I don't know how it sounds in English, but when you read the original holy language, Tehillim, you cannot not be jealous with David Amelech to reach such a level. Every pastor comes from the heart. You see the level he arrived. It's unbelievable. And what he says, V'ani kirvat elokim litov. All I need is to be close to Hashem. That's good for me. Not only that, then he continues and say, Achat shalti me'et Hashem. I have one request from Hashem and that's it, nothing else. Otav akesh. This is all I ask for. Shivti bebet Hashem kol yemei chayai. That I'll be able to sit in the house of Hashem. What's the house of Hashem? To sit in a yeshiva, to hear his Torah. כל ימי חיי, all my life, לחזות בנועם השם, to see the beauty of God, ולבקר בהיכלו, and to visit in a special place. I have a question. Let's see if we're going to catch here what's going on. He just said, David Amelech, I'm dreaming, my dream is, my request is to sit in the house of Hashem, and to see the beauty of Hashem. And right after that he says, and to visit in his home, in his place. You just said that your dream is to be there all your life. Not like a, what do you mean to visit? To visit is once in a while. You come in and you go out. You, want, you just said, I want to be in the house of Hashem all my life. To see the beauty of Hashem. And right after that, contradicting himself. And to be a visitor in his house. So you have to make up your mind. You want to be there all the time? Or you want to be like these guys that comes once a month to Monsi to see how the yeshiva looks. Maybe they change the chandelier over there. <laughs> Who do you want to be? You know, there's a big difference. The secret here, I want to sit in yeshiva all my life and to feel the excitement of a visitor, because the nature of a person, when he gets used to a place, he doesn't appreciate it. When he gets it, the excitement is unbelievable. If Rabbi Ovadia Yosef will call you, my friend Mishael, I heard a lot about you. Can you give me the chance to bring your private tutor two hours a day? <laughs> you gotta check the caller ID a million times. Where did this phone call come? Who's fooling me? <laughs> One thing for sure is you won't answer the question. 
your mouth's not going to speak. What? Why do wants to waste two hours on me? Cannot be. Is it me? Is it a dream? Screaming to his wife, hey! Are we here? But what happened after a month that he learns with him? Rabbi, today I have an important meeting. That's what David Amelech didn't want. I want to feel that it's the first day. To be, to feel like I'm a visitor. <sighs> I told you before, one place, one yeshiva, one synagogue, full unity, the, the salvation will begin. Such a shame. The, the Zohar says, Achdut, every time there is un, unity in a place, the Midat Adin, the judgment, the judgment cannot hurt that place at all. They give an example, in the generation of the flood, when Hashem destroyed the entire world with rain and flood, it says, what really was the verdict signed for in the end? What made them really die in the end? These people were making the worst sex crimes in the Torah. That each one of their crimes was a, a, a punishment of karet. It's the worst punishment in the Torah. And the soul gets cut out of Olam Abba. There's no part of the world to come. Couldn't be worse punishment than this. So they were making millions of sins that each one of them is the worst punishment and they were still alive. For that, God still had patience for them, sitting and waiting for them. What, in the end, caused him to drown them on and to kill them? That they used to steal one from the other. Stealing. That's no unity over there. I don't need you here. You can be the most wicked person in the world, ten wicked people, but they united, nothing can happen to them. The importance of unity. When they build the Babylonian tower, they decided to make a tower and go fight against Hashem. The idea sounds ridiculous. What a fool is going to try to build a tower to go up to the sky to look for Hashem and fight against Him? What, what, I don't understand I mean, how fool you can be. How fool you can be. And you know what? Hashem got very nervous from them. He was panicking. Wow. Sounds like a joke, huh? In that case, please explain me why he had to go down and mix their language. He mixed their language. All of a sudden, they did not understand. One guy told him, give me the hammer. He used to give it to him on his head. <laughs> why? Because he convinced their languages. That means God came to their brain. Until today, he was speaking French. Let's say all of them speaking one language. He took a third of them, switched something in their brain. They want to speak French, they speak German. He wants to speak Bukharian, he speaks Yemenite. What's going on? What happened to the Ashpolo? It became Melawach. Finished. And they started to fight. Why? Hashem wanted to teach us unity even to these wicked people. When they united, they're successful. When they united, they successful. <sighs> Rabbeinu Yonah, about 800 years ago, 800 years ago, Rabbeinu Yonah, he wrote in his book about the Pasuk in Mishlei, the book of King Solomon. Aboteach ba'ashem yesugav min ha'tzara b'schar ha'bitachon. Af al pi sh'ayta tzara re'uya lavo alav mitbatelet. Translation. If you have confidence in Hashem, you are protected from the trouble, from the problems that is on the way to you as a reward for your achievement, that you reach a level of confidence in God, 
you are protected from the problems that are on the way to you. That means in Yom Kippur, Hashem sentenced you to X amount of problems, and this date, and that date, from that place, from another place, it's on the way to you. But if you're strong in your confidence, it comes near you, and it doesn't touch you. Even though he deserved fully to receive this punishment, since he has a very high level of confidence in Hashem, it doesn't touch him. So in that case, what's the greatest achievement in life? The most recommended thing that we have to run after that with all our hearts and all our souls. What is it? To work on our level of emunah, faith, confidence. Why? If a person comes and says, I have a ticket for you. Here is this ticket. What are you going to do with that ticket? Every time someone is about to attack you and stop you and give you a ticket or arrest you, you come like this, you go like this, excuse me, sir, uh, you know, this is what I have. Ah, no problem. Okay, drive slow, okay? How are you doing, buddy? Keep up the good work. Next time, don't drive 85, just drive 82, okay? Whatever it is, someone gave it to me. I don't know what to do with that. If you want, you can have it. <laughs> anyway, if we had a ticket like this, that whenever someone comes to hurt us, we, we pull it out like this, the person falls down on the floor and crawls down under our feet. If somebody comes to attack you, to steal money from you, you pull it out, he's on the floor. The dog is on the way to attack you. You go like this, he's down. Your wife is about to scream that she wants more money. You go like this, you say, oh, you gave me so much money today. What a wonder, magic. You're protected from everything. Wouldn't you pay everything you can for that ticket? Comes Hashem and says, listen, I give you a discount, free of charge. Free of charge. Read some good books. Chovat al Vavot. You know, Mesilat Mesilat Yisharim. Read five, six good books. Read them again. Very good. Learn them very good, and repeat it because the way of the evil inclination is is to make you forget. Read it all the time. Nothing can harm you. Keep it or not, just read it. Read. There's nothing to keep. All you have to do is to reach a level of emuna, confidence in Hashem. I lost. My life just got saved. That's why I'm not, I never complained. Uh, I didn't find a wife. Hashem knows that if I had a wife, I would be a very miserable person. So he saves me from a wife. <laughs> I didn't go into the partnership. Probably something bad is about to happen there. Thank you, Hashem, for not giving me the deal. Many examples like this in life. I got that wife because the other one didn't want me and I was afraid to stay alone. Thank you, Hashem. I guess this wife will bring me a lot of pleasure in life. Great things will come. Everything that you get, look at that positive. Baruch Hashem that I have it. Somebody else doesn't even have this. What's worse? To be single or to be not happily married? What do you think? <laughs> huh? Why are you not happily married? <laughs> Me? I'm very happily married. <laughs> uh, my wife, it's, uh, she said it, I didn't say it. I'm very happy in my marriage. Baruch Hashem. I wonder what my wife is preparing me now. You know, you, I open my mouth now. <laughs> I tell you, you know what? You know the joke, right? I told you the joke. You want to be happily married, it's for the men, not for the women. And the day of your wedding, make sure you prepare a chair next to the door. When you walk into the house, you take the chair, break it on your wife's head, knock her down on the floor, and now she's going to say, well, what did I do? You say, you didn't do anything, so why you broke my head? This is to show you that when you do nothing, this is what you get. Just imagine if you dare to do something. That's it, you'll be a very happy guy.
Can we edit the video after? <laughs> Don't take me serious over there. One thing for sure, violence never ever solved the problem. Never. Only makes problem worse. No way in the world that a person will be violent to others and he thinks the problem is over. The Gemara says, Birzot Hashem Darke Ish Gam Oivav Yashlim Imo. When Hashem is satisfied from the way of a person, a man, his enemies are surrendering to him and wants to make peace with him. Chazal say, who is the enemies of the person? Guess what? His family members. That's the answer. If Hashem is happy from him, his family admire him. What a father I have. Oh, what a husband I have. Baruch Hashem, that Hashem sent me such a husband. If Hashem is not happy from you, your wife complaining from the morning to the night, 2.4 million complaints in one day. You don't know where to start. And you choose, you know, my clothes is not fitting me anymore. I need special this, I need that. My car is leaking. When are you going to replace my car? Uh, why didn't you make me a new credit card? It's not fair. I called you three times today. You didn't answer my call. Why you don't want my parents in Yom Tov? Why you want to go over there? They're not going to give us uh, this. They're not going to give us that. There's no cold water there. There's no hot water there. All day like this. All your life is like this. I have a friend like this. I call him up. How are you doing? Lousy. <laughs> always. Always. Lousy. Why? He said the name of his wife. I, I, I don't say anything anymore. I already know. <laughs> lousy. Always lousy. So what's better? To stay single. What? <laughs> but we have a problem. If you stay single, you don't make the first mitzvah in the Torah. Provo. The ladies, if they stayed single, they didn't miss this mitzvah. They're not obligated to have children. It's interesting. The ladies that don't have an obligation to have children, they are the ones who take all the suffering from the children. <laughs> a man that is obligated to have children, it should have been technically the other way around. He should give his heart and his energy and his strength for these children. Because that's his mitzvah, that's his continuation. If he wouldn't have it, he'll get punished. If a person can marry and he doesn't want to get married, Hashem can take him away from here and say, you fail your life. I don't need you here anymore. The ladies could live all her life. For instance, let's assume that her husband didn't want kids. For whatever reason, she is not guilty. He's guilty. And she is carrying all the pain and the suffering. That's why in the Gemara, when one of the rabbis had a very, very wicked wife, so his students told him, Rabbi, just get rid of her already. How much, we can, how much you can suffer? His answer to them was, it's enough that she's raising my children. For that I owe her so much, cannot complain. That's the answer he gave. It's enough, she's raising the children. She's doing a good job, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Plus, he has another bonus. What's the other bonus? The Gemara says someone who has a very annoying and hard personality wife is dismissed from hell. That's a replacement from hell. It's not a joke. If you have a wicked, evil wife that made you very hard life, <laughs> all the guys are smiling now. So, wow, Baruch Hashem, my wife is like that. <laughs> they just found out they're not going to go to hell. <laughs> One thing for sure, all the single guys here are going to look for the bad girls now. <laughs> it's better, suffer 30 years than 300 years. It's a good deal. Ay, ay, ay. David Amelech wrote, Yasor Israniya, we say that today in Alel, when well, it was Rosh Chodesh today, Rosh Chodesh Sivan. יאסור ישרא ניה, או וואה, יאסור ישרא ניה, ולמוות לא נתנני. השם, he tortured me a lot. ייסורים, you know what's ייסורים, with you. I suffer a lot. 
but it doesn't kill me. Velamavet lo netanani. So David Amelech is praising Hashem, thank you that you're torturing me and you're not killing me. What's the secret here? Well, he's lying. If it would be a lie, it wouldn't be an integral part of the Tanakh. It's in the Tanakh of Hashem. If Hashem wouldn't agree with what she said, that means God forbid he thought he's lying, we wouldn't read it in the Alel every Rosh Chodesh and every holiday. So what's the secret here? That means he really meant it. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you so much that you're torturing me so much, but you didn't kill me. Today, it's the opposite. People say, kill me already. Kill me. Enough with this. I can't take this anymore. You don't kill me, I'll kill myself. Not doing me a favor. That's today's. David Amelach said the opposite. So what's the secret here? What's harder? To suffer every minute of your life? Sicknesses, pain, back pain, feet, headache, migraines, money problems, parnasa, embarrassment. So many problems people have. And not to die, or just to die and get rid of all these 20, 30 years of suffering that are yet to come. What's better? Technically, a person goes to sleep, he doesn't wake up, he got rid of 30 years of suffering. Sounds like a better deal, no? But David HaMelech didn't agree with us. David HaMelech does not agree with us. He knew much more than us. So what's the point here? Hmm? What are we understanding from here? As long as the person is still alive, even in the hardest tisurim, the hardest suffering, is earning every minute. Is earning every minute. Masha'en can when he dies. When he dies, there's no more earning, no more profits. Every second you're alive, you earn. If you do the right things. He was doing the right things. So keep me with any suffering you want. Give me another day. He would fight for any extra minute. Why? It's another 500 mitzvot for him. It's another two mitzvot. It's another five. It's another 20. The payment's going to be larger and larger by the minute. So why do you worry? Why do you worry? Ma'it onen adam chai in echa. Why a living person should have the guts to complain? That's what, that's what the Enecha Gimel, you can see it over there. Ma itonen adam chai. Why are you complaining? You are alive. What reason you have to complain? In another place, the prophet came to the nation of Israel and said, Hashem is sick and tired from the nonsense and the complaints that you are speaking all the time. He's sick and tired of listening to you. What are we learning from this? We've got to realize how many complaints we're saying. Cannot complain. Cannot complain. But Rabbi, what do you mean cannot complain? I cannot be a hypocrite. I feel bitter in my heart. What? So what do you want me to say? Well, <laughs> there's a guy here in Muncie, every day I see him, he's suffering a lot. Nothing works for him in Parnassah, Parnassah-wise. So every morning I see him, no, what's new, how, is, how you feel? He said, oh, it wasn't good like this in the, for 70 years. <laughs> that's, that's the answer he gives me every morning. It wasn't better in the last 70 years. It couldn't be better. Some people say it couldn't be worse. What's the difference? You know what's the difference? When a person says it couldn't be worse, right away Hashem says, ah, it couldn't be worse, I'm going to teach you what worse. <laughs> Two weeks later, just when he thought he lost 20% of his income, he just found out he went, down to, he went up to 90% loss. One word. Couldn't be worse. Ah, couldn't be worse? I'll show you how worse it could be. <laughs> That's what it says. Shmoret Motsas Fater. A person has to be careful what comes out of his mouth. The power of speech. Words have power. The world was created with words. Hashem spoke few words, and here we are. With the power of speech. 
words are killing, words are reviving. The prophet spoke few words, Yechezkel, thousands of bodies came back to life from few words that came out of Yechezkel's mouth. Elisha spoke few words, revived two bodies from the grave. Eliyahu Anavi spoke few words, he flew to the sky, alive with his body. Everything is words. A person has millions of cows. He say, all these cows is Hekdesh, all the cows goes to Bet Amikdash. A person says, I am going to be a monk, Nazir. All my life, all my life, every day of his life, he cannot touch grapes, wine, nothing except Shabbat. That's, that's what the Gemara says, should be more precise. I am going to be a monk in the day that Mashiach will come. That's what he said. <laughs> well, how do you know when Mashiach comes? Maybe today. You have to expect him every day. So what did he say? I am Nazir in the day that Mashiach comes. Finished. All your life you Nazir now. Except Shabbat. Why except Shabbat? Because we have in tradition, even though some disagree with that, that Mashiach doesn't come on Shabbat or on Yom Tov. For many reasons. Maybe he will not travel from one territory to the other. Maybe he doesn't want to bother us in Yom Tov. Maybe there's different reasons for that. I don't know. Some say Mashiach for sure can come on Shabbat or on Yom Tov. But either way, the Gemara says, if a person says one word, all his life is Nazir. Cannot cut his hair. No grapes, no raisins, no wine. It's a list of the things that a person cannot do when he's a monk, Nazir. What if, what if you bro broke the rules? What? What if you think about it? You don't say it. If you think, it's no problem. The only thing that commits you when you think, if you commit to give X amount of tzedakah to someone, then you will bind it to give it even if you did not say it in your mind. So that means if a Talmud Chacham came to you and it asked you for help and you had in your mind, you closed in your mind, tomorrow at 2 o'clock you're going to come and give him $500. Tomorrow you woke up, you'll be, your Yetzer Hara begins to say, hey, what are you crazy, you give him $500? What, you, what made you so generous today? I don't like it really. Give him 100 it's enough. Break it to five payments. <laughs> So if you give him less, then you have a problem. It's like nether in the mind, but it's only when it comes to tzedakah. It's hard to understand. It's not a joke. That's why a person should make a rule never to go, whatever I think, it's not a final decision. Only what I say in my mouth, that's a final decision. If you say to someone, I'm going to give you X amount of money, that's it, you got to give it to him. The Gemara says, Paro, it's, it's very interesting Gemara, we learn a lot from it. Gimel ayu bota etza, you know this Gemara? The free advisor who gave him a bad advice against the Jews. Bilam, he is the one who gave the bad advice, and he died. Eov, he was silent. He did not say a word. And Itro ran away. What was the outcome for that? Itro that ran away, he did not want to answer. His merit was, his reward was that his grandchildren, of course they were all Jews because Itro came to convert, and they were sitting in Lishkata Gazit. Lishkata Gazit, that's where Sanhedrin is. Some of the grandchildren of Yitro became big rabbis. That's his reward for not participating in the plan against the Jewish nation. Very nice. Bilam, that there was the mind that made up the entire bad advice, what happened to him? He died. And Iov, that didn't say anything. He didn't say, yeah, do it. He didn't say, don't do it. He was just standing over there. He got the worst suffering in the history. Nobody in the history suffered more than him. He lost his billions. He was the richest guy. He lost all his money. He lost his children. He was sick. 
sicknesses. He told Hashem, maybe you confuse me between the word Iov to Oyev. It's the same spelling, just in the wrong order. You sure that you're thinking that I'm Iov? Maybe you're thinking I'm Oyev instead of Iov. That's how bad he was suffering. So now my question to you is, if Bilam that deserves the worst punishment, one second, one second, he died and it's over. Eov that hardly did anything, he was just silent, suffered for so long. What are we learning from it? To say so. That to stay alive and suffer, it's much better than to die. So all the people who kill themselves make themselves a very big damage. First, they lose the reward of the suffering. Second, they're going to be sentenced for murder. Because a person that kills himself is a regular murderer. It's a violation of the Ten Commandments. You should not kill anyone, include yourself. If you kill yourself, it's like killing somebody else. I, I just answer it. I say it's better to have all the suffering in the world. Ah, mentally sick is a different story. Mentally sick, if a person killed himself in a state of insanity, is not guilty of murder. Is not. Or if it's Kiddush Hashem, for instance, they want to commit him, make a scene in public, and he jump into the fire, like Shaul HaMelech jump on the sword. There are many heroes that committed suicide. That's not Chaz Shalom a murderer. That's for the sake of heaven. And the truth is, from this story that I just told you, we learn one very important thing. That the suffering in this world is nothing compared to the suffering of the world to come. How do we learn it from the story? Who understood what I just said? How do we understand from the punishment that Bilam got and the punishment that Eov got that the punishments in this life is nothing, it's a picnic compared to the suffering after life. Because God called himself, I'm the God of the justice. No one can bribe me. Bilam that brought a holocaust to the Jewish nation with his advice, he's going to suffer 20 seconds and it's over. He died and finished. But this Eov, that they hardly did anything. Eov did, uh, uh, he did nothing compared to Bilam. Suffering for so many years, suffering, his children dying, losing his money, becoming sick. A person that was rich and became poor, that's alone like a death. And all the suffering, read his story, read. There's no suffering more than him. So he got all this suffering in this life just from being quiet. Is it possible that Bilam got a punishment that is much less than him, even though he's 99% of the problem? What are we learning from here? What does Bilam expect after he died? What's the punishment of Bilam? What's his punishment? Who knows? What did he get? The Gemara says that Unculus, Unculus was the nephew of Titus. Titus, the Roman, that came to destroy Bet HaMikdash, Titus. He had a nephew. His sister had a son named Unculus. And after he saw his uncle died, you know how Titus died. A little uh, mosquito went into, his, in, went into his head and started to suck his entire brain over a period of few years and ate up his entire brain. And when they opened up his brain, you know what they found? Guess what? The mosquito was in the size of a bird. Why? Why mosquito not a fly? Why mosquito not a little roach? Why mosquito? Who knows? Because mosquito is the only creature that never needs to go to the bathroom. It's only getting in and nothing going out. So the more they suck blood, the, the more they, they grow. Hashem got him somebody that will take it and will not release it. It will grow and grow and grow inside his brain and destroy him. You know the story in Egmara, what happened with him? 
that he, he was hearing all the time the mosquito inside his brain is whistling non-stop, it's driving him crazy. One day he was walking in the street, he saw five people working with hammers, banging. The mosquito got nervous, he heard his banging, he stopped whistling. So Titus said, oh, wow, for years I didn't have such a, it's a timeout. <laughs> Something is, so he went to the guys, he said, come, come. Come work for me in a palace. All of you are hired. They said that the, the Caesar wants to hire them. It's good money. In the, one of them was a Jew. So he brought them in. All day they're banging. All day they're banging. In the end of the days, he say, okay, come get your salary. So the first non-Jew come, he pays him his salary. The second, the third, the fourth, the fifth. The Jew is standing there in the end. So the Jew come and say, he said to the Jew, you're not ashamed of yourself? You want money? So the Jews say, why, I didn't work like them all day? Why I don't deserve money? So the, the Titus told him, not only you sitting here all day and enjoying seeing me suffering like this, you want to get paid for it? <laughs> you see, I gave you such a show, you sit and enjoy, you got to pay me a ticket for that. In the end, the, the mosquito got used to it the next day. He saw, ah, it's no problem, banging. I can go back on my own. Started to whistle until he finished him. So Unculus made a seance. Seance, Ouija board, whatever you want to call it. And he communicated with three wicked people. That's what the Gemara says. That's why he converted to Judaism. You see his name in a Chumash. When you read Parashat HaShavua, you see Targum Unculus. He is a convert. Convert from the nation of Rome that came to destroy Bet HaMikdash. What happened with him is, he called Bilam, Bilam, the prophet of the Goim, and he told Bilam, who's important in heaven? And Bilam told him, the Jews, they are important over there, the nation of God. So he asked him, what should I do? Should I join them? He said, no, go against them. <laughs> go against them. You go against them, you'll be successful. Hashem doesn't put them in the hand of losers, only in the hand of very powerful, successful Gentiles. You want to be great? Go against them. You'll be successful. <laughs> he said, thank you very much. What's your punishment in the world to come? So he told him, since I was having relation with my donkey, you know the story with Bilam, what happened is they put me in a swimming pool, I don't want to tell you what's inside the swimming pool. If you want to know what's inside, go to the Gemara. The Gemara will tell you. What? What? With the next one that he called, who was the next one? His uncle, T Titus. He calls him. He says, who is important? He told him Israel. What should I do to convert? He said, no, go against them. You'll be a king. Same thing he told him. So what's your punishment in the world to come? He say every day they burns me, they burn me and they take my ashes and spread it in seven different oceans and rivers. And then Hashem is collecting my ashes back into a body and they reburn me and it's going again and again and again and I have no peace of mind. That's his punishment. So then he brought in his seance J.C. Penny. He called him. He said, J.C. Penny, I heard you're going bankrupt. <laughs> Business is not good recently. M Macy's is down. You're also down. So J.C. told him, listen, who is important up there? He told him the Jews. So he said, what should I do? Should I join them or should I go against them? He said, yes, you should convert. You should join them. You should be special. So he said, what punishment you got? So he told him his punishment. They put him also in a swimming pool full of the bathroom stuff. Yes, that's, well, that's his punishment. Because the Gemara says, Someone who makes fun at what the rabbis say or the rules that they set up has the worst punishment in hell. The worst. We don't want to go into details, believe me. But he asked him, what should I do? Should I go against them or should I join them? And he said, join them. The Gemara say, come and learn the difference between the wicked non-Jews 
to the wicked Jews, because he was a Jew when he died as a Jew. Only a hundred years later, 70 to 100 years later, they started their religion. Those who started Christianity never saw him. They never saw him. They heard from someone who heard from someone. I don't have to tell you how many things. They never saw to witness the stories that they tell about him. All these stories is all nonsense. Someone made it up. Somebody came and said that he had a dream. Very interesting how this phony religion started with a bunch of rumors from all over. There's many different sources. 300 years later, they became an official strong religion when the Romans joined them and the Greeks and all the others. The reason that they canceled the entire rules of the Torah was because the Romans and the Greeks did not want to join them. They said the religion is too difficult for us. What is this? Not to eat, kosher, not kosher, Sabbath. Because J.C. himself told his student to keep all the laws. He said, you're not allowed to change one letter from the Torah. If somebody changed a letter from the Torah, it will be cares in the kingdom of heaven. But after he died, they started to change the laws. Started to cancel one mitzvah and another one and another one until we know the rest. Yeah. I want to ask, can I ask you a question? To take, uh, to smoke drugs every day. It's good or it's a lie? It's bad, right? Why so many people doing it? Christianity gives them pleasure. They go to the church. Hallelujah. 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 Rabbi, I just, uh, 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 he comes to the priest. You know, I just killed five people. Put $50 in the box. I forgive you. I forgive you. Very nice. Well, doesn't need to fast. No Yom Kippur. No 20 years of learning, of crying, of vidu every day. Five minutes. It's all over. Wow. Very good religion, no? Easy life. What's hard over there? What's hard in there? Man, fine, Muslims, they, it's also a phony religion, but at least it's a little bit difficult. There's some things to do over there. Over there, everything is allowed. What do you want today? You want to kill today? Okay, come tomorrow, we'll change the law for you. They do whatever they want. Singing, putting some ashes in the church, going with this thing. Like this. You know, very nice one. <laughs> Whatever. I'm making a joke out of it. But it's really an easy religion to keep. People need something spiritual. They search for spirituality. And if it's easy, that's even better. There's nothing to do. Everything is allowed. Very nice. You eat whatever you want. You say whatever you want. You kill whoever you want. It's only going to cost you 50 bucks if you're friends of the priest. could be 50% off. Our religion is hard because Hashem made a rule in this creation. The harder you work, the more you earn. The less you work, the less you earn. That's what we say every day in a prayer. Ratsa kadosh baruchu lezakot et Yisrael, lefichach, irba lahem Torah umitzvot. Hashem wanted to benefit the nation of Israel. That's why He gave them lots of orders and laws, Torah and mitzvot, many things to do, because He wanted to let them earn as much as they can. If you only work an hour a day, or if you work 10 hours a day, when you work harder, you make more money. Just before we finish, I want to read you a story here. This is a letter. Many years ago I, I read it. I found it today in a book. I forgot about it, but today I found it again. Shalom Iran. Dear Iran. When you're going to read this letter, I'm not going to be with you. I'm going to be very far away from you in a different world. I hope that this letter that you're going to read right now will not give you pain and you overcome this and go back to your normal life as soon as you can. But there are things that I felt that I have to write to you, I must tell you. Just a few hours ago, the birthday party that you made for me in a hospital 
was such a great party. It was such a great feeling to see all the friends coming to visit me. And when we said goodbye, you asked me, okay, Udi, Udi, it's Ehud. When are we going to meet again? I answer you, we will live and see. Now you understand probably what was the meaning of the words I told you then. Oh, Iran, there are so much, so many things passed in the last 24 hours, this last 24 hours for me. All the stress of the last three months since they found this terrible disease in my body. The last three months, every day started with hopes and prayers, desperate prayers for salvation and ended with major disappointment. What I had in the last three months, these three short months, I don't wish any other person in the world. I remember it was yesterday, the day we were sitting, my father, my mother and I, waiting for Professor Steinberg, waiting to report what's the results of the exam. We knew that there's some kind of medical problem that I have and the pain that I have in my back that bothered me in the last year has a reason, but we never dream that it's the worst news out of all. The professor came into the waiting room, looked at my father and my mother and gave me a look, in a strange look, for many seconds. His face was frozen. It was hard to know what he's thinking. He asked my father and my mother to go with him to another room. But he told me, stay here, I'll call you soon. I stayed alone in the room. I was trying to listen what they're talking in the other room. Just a minute after I heard the huge scream of my mother in the air. It's impossible, doctor. It has to be a mistake. We have to check again. My heart froze. Two minutes that look like eternity. The doctor called me in. I saw my mother is broken, crying, shaking. My father is white like a ghost. The professor asked me to sit. Udi, I'm very, very sorry, but you have a cancer growth in your back. This is the beginning of the nightmare. It's a fatal growth. And it was discovered too late what makes the chances to recover almost zero. My father and my mother was trying to hide my real situation from me. They trying to pretend that they're optimistic. They were talking about the days after I recover, what are we going to do and where are we going to go. But I wasn't naive. I knew right away what my real situation is. I went to all kinds of treatments, special diets, chemo, I don't know what they did to the cancer, but they destroyed me completely. From a happy boy, full of life, I became a broken tool. Tired, miserable, very skinny, no air, very weak. My last hope was the big surgery. Very complicated surgery that will take six hours with five doctors. Even though no one told me clearly I understood that this is my last chance to live. When I woke up from the surgery, I found my father and my mother standing next to me. My mother was smiling, a sad smile. You feel good, Udi? Mazal tov. It's your birthday, my father said. Then I remember that from all this suffering, I forgot that today it's my birthday and I'm only 17 years old. In the evening, you all came to celebrate with me. It was a great surprise. I saw all my friends that I didn't see for a while. And in the middle of the party, Professor Steinberg arrived. He didn't want to own everything, so he called my father and mother outside. In the room of the hospital, they were going outside with him. We were celebrating inside. Nobody can help what was said outside. My heart was already in a different place. I know that the fortune of my life is being discussed outside. Few seconds later, they returned. 
I was seeing my father holding my mother, she's crying. And I saw that my father is having a hard time to stand on his own. I already knew everything. My father said to the guys, why you stop, continue. Some people were eating, some people were singing, nobody really paid attention to what's going here beyond the, beyond the scene. And then they started to sing, you should have, up, you should live up to 120 years. My mother was crying, my father was begging her to try to stop, but they left the room, they couldn't stay there. The party is over, everyone left. I don't know where to start. A week ago, Frischman was by me. Remember him, Yecheskel Frischman, the old teacher? The one who used to torture in school and give him so much hard time, he came to visit me in the hospital. Isn't it nice of him? He was sitting right next to me asking how I feel and wish me full recovery. He was so nice. I was thinking about all the years we made fun of him and tortured him and humiliate, humiliated him. How we imitated him in his face, embarrassed him in public. I just couldn't stand this feeling. I was embarrassed to ask him to forgive us. He gave me a gift, some chocolates. It was supposed to be sweet, but it was very bitter. I thought to myself, I must go to him before Rosh Hashanah and ask for forgiveness. But then I remember that I probably won't make it to Rosh Hashanah. Then I started to think about my friend Eric. We had a fight. Foolish. Where would I find him to apologize? I heard he went with his parents to America for a year. But five years I haven't heard from him. I have to ask my sister for forgiveness. I was never good to her. I was always busy, never helped her with what she needed. He's giving a list of all the people, just moments before he left this world, how the, the thoughts coming to the minds of a person. So many people to run and ask them to forgive. Where are you going to find them? I want to live. I don't want to be remembered in a book. I have so much to do in life. I try to get, from, get up from the bed, get to the window with the infusion bag. It's a clear night outside. The truth is, I'm not afraid to die. I wouldn't mind technically to move for, to a different world even though I'm only 17. But I would have done it knowing I, I fulfilled my obligation in this life. But when I get to this moment, I realize that I did not really achieve anything. I did not pay, make peace with God. I owe Him a lot. I didn't pay my duties. I didn't go to Daven in Shul in Minyan all the time. It was hard for me to wake up in the morning to Shul. Gemara, I wasn't such an expert in Gemara. I didn't dedicate enough time for it. He's making basically a con a complete calculation about his life. They say, the Gemara, the Gemara brings a story of few people moments before they left the world. You may think in the time of the Gemara, it's 2,000 years ago, people were in a much higher level, but the truth is, we don't have to go that far. Just 200 years ago, six generations ago, they were saying that the Vilna Gaon was sitting in his bed holding a tzitzit, crying, how do I leave a world that for a few dollars, every second you can make a mitzvah? 
Chafetz Chaim only 78 years ago. Before he passed away, he was thinking about his entire life. And he said, I have two hours. But I'm not sure what I did in these two hours. Two hours in his entire life. Every other minute of his life was valuable. But two hours, who knows what he did in these two hours. Maybe he was sitting, resting. Maybe he lay down on a, on a table. I don't know. For sure he didn't go to make scenes. Don't get me wrong. Chafetz Chaim. Two hours of his entire life. Two hours of his entire life. What's going to be with us? How to believe. A person never knows what's going to be next. We're thinking, we're taking things for granted, saving plans, pension plans. When I retire, we're going to move, we're going to do, I have three more years to go. Everyone is dreaming, calculating, planning. What are you thinking? Who are you? You're dust in the wind. Every second you breathe is a gift. Every breath you take, you have to say to Hashem, thank you for another second. Thank you for another minute. No. Tomorrow, basketball. Friday, soccer. Uh, Sunday, two days in Florida on the beach. Wednesday, next Wednesday, my cousin's birthday. Next uh, Hundreds of times, I was speaking to people, I tell them, would you come to the lecture? I'm sorry, Rabbi, we have a birthday party of the cousin of the uncle of my aunt. <laughs> he never missed one of those. <laughs> birthday party! <laughs> Who's the only person in the Torah that had a birthday? That the Torah highlight the fact that he celebrated himself a birthday party. The most righteous person ever lived. Pharaoh. <laughs> Pharaoh! That's why they learned that it's a birthday party. <coughs> Jews never had birthdays. If any, if people would be clever, every year they had their birthday, they should cry for it. I just lost another year of opportunities which I did nothing in. Another year went by. Another year of Bitul Torah, another year of problems in the davening, another year of fightings with friends, another year of problems with the family and the children, another year of aggravations and twenties and who knows. And what does he do? Eat a piece of cake with some pieces of candles on it. Happy birthday to you. What a happy birthday. You should cry over it. A person that is clever would never let people make him birthday. Birthday. Why? What's the occasion? What's the occasion? Did you do any great mitzvah that you want to make a party? Fine. You want to make a party because you just saved the life of 500 Jews. You made a beautiful disc. And everybody who watches become religious. Now you have to make a party to Hashem for giving you the opportunity. Wow. Thank you so much that from all the people in the world you gave me the opportunity to do such a thing. And to earn so much. I understand. You make a party. Thank you for making me win the lottery. And giving me the advice to build an entire yeshiva and support Torah for 20 years. Oh, for that you make a party. Thank you for giving me such a great wife, supportive, righteous, doing so many mitzvot. Make my life so much, so, so much better. I understand. You make a party. Thank you for giving me such a son. He's the light of the world, he's learning Torah, he's writing books, everybody wants to be near him. That's a party. Birthday? First of all, your life just got shortened. That's enough a reason to cry. Because everybody is trying to hang to life, no? Nobody wants to die. I went to the hospital to see once a big rabbi in his last hours of his life. Big rabbi, believe me, I'm telling you big, I mean big. Ah, how he was desperate to leave. Every person was standing there, near, passing nearby. He doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know who he is. Could be righteous, could be wicked, could be just an ordinary person. Come, come. Come, give me a bracha. So the rabbi that I was with went to visit him. He also asked from him a bracha. But that was a, a very big rabbi, big person with midot. 
So he said, no, why are you asking me? You asking for me for bracha? He said, yeah, why not? Maybe you have a merit that nobody else has, that thanks to that it's going to work and save my life. Then he asked for me, he asked for another person, another visitor came. Everyone who came, what do I have to lose? Maybe this Jew has something. Don't know. By the look of the person, you never know who he is. You don't really know. It could be that if that Jew once in his life saved the person and did nothing else, and from that person there was a chain reaction that many other Jews benefit from. And he has a big schut. How do you know? You never know. Any questions before we finish? Shavuot night, do not lose a minute on the learning. Try to finish the meal on Erev Yom Tov very fast. Come right here upstairs or wherever you live, next synagogues to your place, the place that they sit and learn, and try to learn the entire night. We have a special tikkun for Shavuot. They have special sidurim for that, the Sfaradim, the Ashkenazim. They learn different things. But we learn all night and until the morning and sunrise we daven. Then we go home, we make a dairy meal with Kiddush. We make a mozi, we eat dairy, we do Kiddush before, of course. We do Birkat Amazon, we go to sleep because we were up all night. And then we wake up at 1, 2, we don't need to do again Kiddush because we did in the morning. We make a, a meat and wine meal. We serve some meat or chicken, whatever you like. You eat another small meal. And then in the night, it's Erev Yom Tov. It's the second Yom Tov because it's two days in a row. But if the Ari says, if somebody will learn all night without making an extra word, no talking, no nonsense, give me massage, I'm tired, come. Uh, make me coffee. Don't you have cookies here? What kind of is it? Turn the air condition higher. Call the goy. It's too, co- too cold here, too hot here. And none, none of these things. Just focus on the Torah all night. He's going to have a special protections all year in everything he does. Pays to invest that night. This night, we have, to, we have to learn because the nation of Israel, instead of waiting all night, waiting for the Torah to come, they went to sleep. So now for 3,318 years, we up. They went to sleep six hours. We have to be up every year six hours until maybe Hashem will accept our forgiveness. Yes. We do it one night. Technically, the, yom, the first Yom Tov is the important one, yeah. Huh? Only guys, right? Only guys, yeah. Girls can also learn. There's no restriction. If the girl feels that she can stay up and learn Torah, why not? Every girl that learns Torah, she gets rewarded for that. Not like a man, but she does, yeah. <laughs> yeah? Louder. Ah. Any more questions? hundred percent Yom Tov. It's one of the three regalim. Sukkot, Shavuot, and Pesach. Thank you very much. Good night.